Thank you. Thank you all very much. It's great to be here and see you all. We've already had a hug and a kiss out the back, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to get underway, I think. Good evening and welcome, everyone, to tonight's very special Melbourne Symphony Orchestra event. My name's Mary Nicholson from ABC Classic, and I'm delighted to hear, have a wonderful audience here in the Iwaki Auditorium at the ABC Southbank Centre. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of this land, the people of the Coolins Nation, and acknowledge uh, their elders, their traditional elders, past, present, and emerging. As you know, I have a very special guest with me here tonight, Sir Andrew Davis, who is about to embark on his final three weeks as Chief Conductor of the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. Would you please make him welcome? I should say straight away, of course, that we're not losing you. You're coming back next year as the MSO's Conductor Laureate. Oh, yes. I'm going to be turning up like a bad penny, as we say. <laughs> so, yeah. What does that actually mean, Laureate? Uh, well, it means, you know, I, I wear a little thing of laurel <laughs> leaves around my brow every time I conduct. No, no, I collect these titles. You know, I'm, I'm actually conductor of laureate of my very first orchestra, which was the Toronto Symphony, and I'm conductor laureate of the BBC Symphony Orchestra also. So, Exactly. Know. I was thinking you don't, well, in your professional life, you don't like divorce, do you? No, I don't. You like long-term <laughs> marriages. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, actually, because, in fact, um, although, you know, my career is getting to be fairly lengthy, one way or another, um, I've actually held very few titles, mm. but I've held them all for a rather long time. I was in Toronto from 1975 to 1988, and then I was at Glyndebourne at the Glyndebourne Festival Opera from 1988 to 2000, and at the same time, from 1989 to 2000, I was chief conductor of the BBC Symphony Orchestra. And now I'm actually in my 20th season as uh, music <coughs> director of the Lyric Opera of Chicago. So, and this, is, and this is the end of seven years here. This is short for me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so the, this idea of continuity is very important to you, isn't it, it would seem? Yes, it is. And I, you know, I go back to Toronto every year. I go back to BBC every year. And it's like going back to family. And so you know, I'm, mm. I'm looking forward to the same kind of relationship here. Yeah, why, what do you get out of that, though, Sir Andrew? Because a lot of uh, chief conductors do their tenure, and then they sort of fade away into the sunset. Yeah. Um, but as you say, you like these continuing relationships. Relationships. Well, I, I've, I always enjoy that. As I say, it's like going back to my various families <laughs> every year, and, and that's that's a source of, of, of great joy for me, actually, to 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 be, you know, the Toronto Symphony I, I first conducted in 1974. So it's you know it's 45 years since I conducted them for the first time. That's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So you actually don't sign up for a chief conductorship lightly either. You must be pretty strongly aware that it's going to be successful when you when you sign on the bottom line. Well, with an it, orchestra, seeing it, you've yes. done so few, actually. Well, that's right. I mean, I first came here to conduct the MSO in 2009. And um, actually, I, I, I just, my son and I, Edward, who will be arriving here tomorrow morning, uh, we had three weeks holiday in New Zealand right before I came here, which was fantastic. I, I'd always been fascinated by New Zealand. Sorry, I mean, I'd, I'd been fascinated by Australia <laughs> as well, of course. But um, <laughs> so, um, uh, and we had a great time. And, and the, you know, the nice thing, he, he was 19, and I knew it was the last time I'd spend th th three weeks alone with my son. <laughs> Uh, and I have to say that, you know, I came here after this wonderful holiday and, and had two glorious weeks with the orchestra. I mean, we did a Wagner. You did Falstaff, didn't you? Mm, yes, we did Elgar yeah, Falstaff. Yeah. And, uh, and in the second week, we did Siegfried Idyll, the four last songs with Christine Brewer. And, um, and um, what else? Oh, we did, you know, my sort of 48 minutes excerpts from Goethe Demerum with six harps. <laughs> no, I think, we, yeah, maybe, do, do we have six harps? Probably. Um, <laughs> and it was smashing. Uh, but actually, my wife had, earlier that year, had a bout with cancer and um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and she'd been through chemo, and, and she was in remission, and we all were very happy. And while I was here, the, uh, she called me and said it came back. 
So I have to say, everybody here was so nice. I did cancel. I was supposed to go to Perth afterwards. I canceled that. And I remember who? it well because you came and did a scheduled interview with me, which was an hour-long interview. Right. And we only found out afterwards that you'd had that call. So yeah. you're incredibly a professional. <laughs> well, uh, anyway, it was it was a it was a great time, and then I came back every every year and until I became chief conductor in uh, 2013. Okay, so that leads me, of course, immediately to the question of why you take on these particular orchestras. And obviously, um, you say you had a nice holiday in New Zealand, you came here and you did some nice work with the orchestra. Um, firstly, are there any similarities between these orchestras that you've had these long marriages with? I'm thinking, well, also there's the Chicago Lyric, where you've been for a very long time, since 2000, I think you signed yes, with them, and you're going on with them forever into the sunset. No, I'm, I have one, uh, I have another 18 months. <laughs> I, I'm retiring at the end of next you. season, in, in sort of like <laughs> April of 2021. But so. yeah, Chicago, I'm thinking Toronto, Melbourne, they're not... Um, they're not look at me cities, you know, they're not New York and Sydney. Whoops, did I say that? <laughs> they say yeah. what? They, they have a certain commonality, don't you Ooh. think? <laughs> do, you, do you feel there's something I I don't know. It's um I means well, Toronto is not Montreal, you know. Well, no, well, I think what the the, the three orchestras, mm. Toronto, BBC and, and Melbourne have in common is is a great love for what they do. I mean, not to say that other orchestras don't, but there's there's a, a kind of joy in music making, which to me is, you know, people say, what what is the most important thing a conductor can do? And my feeling is always what I, what is, I think is my job, and what I really desire to do is make everybody that makes music with me, you know, love it and think, aren't we lucky to do this for, for a living? You know, I think it's uh, because we are. It's, you know, and I have to remind myself of that occasionally when I'm, you know, I, I arrived here on Saturday morning and, <laughs> you know, this is day three. So I, that's usually the worst. So if I fall asleep, just yell at me, okay? Well, yeah, and I should say <laughs> that you, uh, not recent, well, a couple of days previously, you were in, um, you're in Toronto. Wasn't yes, it? well, I, I did just did two weeks with with tr the Toronto Symphony. Actually, I'm because I, uh, I've been f this season and last season they're between music directors. So mm. I, in You've addition to being conductor laureate, there. I have uh, for the last two years I've been interim artistic director, <laughs> <laughs> which has been, meant the, the fun thing of putting programs together, and which I, 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 I love that. But yeah, so blizzards, um, blizzards in Toronto to. <laughs> Yeah, pre-summer well, conditions here in Melbourne. So well, I have to say, you know, <laughs> I was in uh, Toronto and Ottawa and Montreal because we mm. did a little, we did a little trip, um, and that was last week. And, and the week before, we did a concert performance of Massenet's Thais, which of course I did here a couple of years ago as well. Um, but it was, you know, it's now minus <laughs> zero. And, well, you're looking very and pale and, and happy. It's, it's snowing, so this Considering is the change in weather. Come here and th this wonderful well, weather. Well, you've actually brought the sunshine to Melbourne, I have to say. Well, Your timing is immaculate. Yeah. Now, I know you have a cousin, a long-lost cousin here in Melbourne. Was that the reason you took the job here? Um, no. Uh, it, it, it proved to be a, a fantastic... Um, uh, Reunion? Yeah, well, I mean, because we, we grew up in different parts of England in the days when, you know, nobody traveled anywhere. Uh, you know, I lived in Hertfordshire, she lived in Derbyshire, and it was like we saw each other probably four or five times in the entire, you know, uh, in, in our entire youth. And then she emigrated here in the 60s. Okay. And uh, so I, you know, got, we made contact, and we were absolutely bosom buddies. I mean, you know, we, we sit down and we start talking and we can't stop. And uh, I don't know, we, we, uh, we're so temperamentally alike. And uh, so she was a find here. And then the orchestra, we better get on to why you, why this chemistry happened between you and the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. Was it a slow burn or was it apparent from your first visit in 2009? It was apparent to me. I don't know whether it was apparent <laughs> to them, but I, I, I just love making music with them. And um, so... I can't remember what year it was because I started in 2013, so it was probably something like 2011. Um, Hugh Humphreys uh, came over, and um, and also Harold Mitchell, our former chairman, 
whom I absolutely adore, by the way, He's, uh, and was a, has been a huge supporter of the orchestra. They came over on Harold's private jet to New York, where I was conducting Don Giovanni at the Met, and then they came backstage, and um, Harold proudly announced that he'd slept through most of it. <laughs> but, uh, um, but then, you know... Um, <laughs> you can say that when you've got your private jet. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and then uh, Hugh and I went for a walk in Central Park, and by the time we'd finished, I decided to take the job. Uh, and, uh, you know, I haven't regretted it for a minute. You said that there's this joyous um, aspect of the, the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra that musicians, they love making music. And uh, what about, though, the... I mean, they say music's a universal language, but, you know, there are, there are different dialects within that musical language. And, you know, Australians have that reputation for being laid back. Did you find laid musicians back. of the, we, yeah, the orchestra laid back in any way? Only in a good way, you know, yeah. I mean... Uh, in a fun way. Yes, they, they don't get hysterical. Yes. Unless I do, of course, <laughs> but then, uh, then, then I have only myself to blame for that. But no, uh, and um, uh, what I love about... This is, this is sort of embarrassing. What I love about Australians is <laughs> many things, but... You know, in this country, you, you tell it like it is, you know. It's a very straightforward, um, but always in a kind of nice way, at least <laughs> in my experience so far. And, and, and I like that. There's a sort of honesty and a lack of pretension here that I really adore, I, I think. Um, and, uh, and that sort of comes across in the music making, I, I suppose. A directness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Call it like it is. So, at the same time, taking this post, you must have seen things that you wanted to do with this orchestra. What, what made you sign on the line? What did you think you could do as chief conductor while you were here? Well, um, I, I've always loved the orchestra sound, and I suppose I just wanted to, to kind of develop that and, and just enrich it. What I did mean, you like about the sound when you first... Well, I mean, I love the string sound of this orchestra. <laughs> How much did she pay you? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it has a tremendous warmth and mm. intensity that I adore. Um, and of course, we have fantastic wind and brass soloists. So there's, um, you know, there's very distinguished music making going on uh, in, the, in the woodwind and brass. You know, and, and, and there's a sort of... Um, there's a sense of tradition here that uh, I like also very much. You know, you going back to Iwaki, I suppose, and, and um, uh, so I, I feel that I'm sort of I'm actually following a, a great line and a great tradition, and. Uh, and hoping to, you know, build It's interesting on that. you talk about tradition. I mean, this is Australia's oldest orchestra. Yeah. Um, at the same time, you know, we don't have that length of tradition of classical music in this country. We're regarded as a young country, culturally, yeah. uh, whereas someone like yourself from the UK, there's a, a, a stronger, well, longer culture. So is the attraction to places like Toronto and, and Melbourne, Australia, the fact that it is a bit of a frontier and, and you can make change, whereas, you know, in some of the the traditional fortresses of, of culture in Germany and so right. forth. It's very difficult, isn't it, to make change? Yes, I almost took a, uh, an orchestra yeah. in Germany. It was actually the same time I went to the BBC and, and to Gleinborn. I've, I've been offered an orchestra in Germany, and, and uh, I haven't actually worked in Germany or indeed in Europe a, a huge amount. You know, I've, of course, I've conducted the orchestras in Paris and, and Rome and, and, and Leipzig and Dresden and, and Frankfurt. And um, yes, there, and there is a sense in which, I suppose, uh, although it, it's changing too, but I, I think the, the audience is, you feel there's a long tradition, mm. not only from the playing, and you know, the players and the orchestras, but also from, from the audiences who, you know, have, it, it, it's fascinating because, you know, as you know, I live in Chicago and the Chicago Symphony, uh, I mean, we, when I first went to the Lyric in, in the year 2000, this is a, this is a sort of demographic thing that's, that's fascinating to me. Uh, we used to, we did 103% ticket sales. And you say, how can you do 103% ticket sales? And, and the answer was 
that, um, you know, pe that far more people bought, bought subscriptions than they do now, and I think that's a universal phenomenon. Um, but, you know, people who would, uh, the, you know, some people who bought subscriptions would then leave Chicago for three months in the winter and go down to Florida, and they'd turn their <laughs> subscriptions in so you could sell them again. But those were the sort of palmy days, and, and we're all sort of fighting for, for the, especially the younger audiences mm. now. Um, you know, there's so much competition, not only in the, you know, the entertainment field, but, you know, m what you can do on your own. Sure. <laughs> One of my favorite cartoons I've seen was, was uh, the old people's home of the future. And they're, they're all sort of, you know, bending, and they're looking at their palms, which have nothing in them. Where's the phone? Um, and not a favor of them in concert halls, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. No, I, but I think, um, but even in America, you see, the, um, as audiences have got younger, the, you, you feel the sort of background because, you know, when, when the major orchestras were founded in the States, they were basically founded through the philanthropy of, of, of U European mm, immigrants who, who wanted to have, you know, they wanted the... the Vienna Philharmonic in, in their hometown. So, you know, you have places like Cleveland, for instance, mm. still fantastic orchestra that um, was founded for, for that reason, really. So how did you devise, you know, I mean, you've got an enormous repertoire from your huge experience, Sir Andrew. How did you decide what directions to go with repertoire with the Melbourne Symphony? Because obviously, those of us who knew a bit about you and your background when you first came here, we, we expected, you know, Sir Andrew's trademark, Elgar, Vaughan right. Williams, you know, the wonderful English music that you've done so well over the Although, decades. Uh, of but course, this you came in with some surprises too. Yes, well, you and know. I just wondered what your, you know, vision was. Well, I love doing a wide repertoire. I don't yeah. do, I don't do Baroque music because mm. I think there are people who specialize in that. But Apart from Handel. Well, yeah, well, yes. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk come about to that him in a minute. later. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and you know, I, I love every period. I have Mozart and Haydn and Beethoven and, and you know, the Romantics and, and and 20th century music. I mean, we when I was here in July, we did this marvelous Stravinsky double bill of Rite of Spring, but also Persephone, um, which is a piece that I've always loved and, mm -hmm. and, and doesn't get done that often. So you know. Also, the idea of doing music that is nece not necessary for for me. And one one thing that we we did, which was we did a major doses of Charles Ives, which I think went down with a um, uh, mixed degree of enthusiasm. So, but but I, when we did the the fourth symphony, which of course we recorded all this this music for for Chandos, and when we did the fourth symphony, I've, I've done it probably that's probably the fourth or fifth time I've done it in my life, and it's incredibly difficult, mm. needs two conductors. And, you know, one is conducting that piece, you're usually happy if you get through it without it, without it breaking down. <laughs> but this performance that we did was so much more than that. I, it was by far the best performance I've ever done of it, and the recording is fantastic. And um, so, you know, there were some projects like that that we did. And, uh, well, we just recorded, and, and it's... Uh, coming out shortly, we, we recorded, uh, just in a few months ago, we recorded the second symphony by Eugene Goossens. Yes, Goossens, Granger and Ives, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and last year we recorded with Tasman Little, the uh, Goossens Violin Concerto, so that's coming out. And it's a very important, the second symphony, a, a big piece, we, we just went into the, uh, in, uh, out in Monash and recorded it. We didn't do a performance of it or anything, but it's, uh, I, I'm very pleased with the way it's coming out. So the, and I do remember actually a week, because I think we started this b before I became chief conductor. We, we actually put together a CD of music by Goosens, mainly smaller pieces. The biggest piece was the, 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 the concert piece, which was the family concerto, because, uh, Eugene Goosens had two sisters who were harpists, one of whom I knew very well, and she died at the age of 106, <laughs> Sid, Siddeley. And of course, the f most famous oboe player of his time, uh, 
Leon Goosen. So this was this is a piece for Ovo doubling cor corably and two harps, one of the most <laughs> unusual combinations for a concerto that I know. Um, but we so and we did one day for three years. <laughs> so we finally, but and the week when we were um, uh, doing the f the final uh, session for for this um, Goosen's recording, we were also recording during the week. Uh, a whole um, a whole lot of Percy Granger choral music and and we did we, they recorded the concerts and then we, mm. we did some uh, and that that we did in um, in uh, Hamer and the last day of that was Saturday but on Friday we were in Monash finishing off this Goosen's recording and I remember this is a bit risque I suppose but I remember saying to the orchestra at the end of the Goosen session on Friday, I said, well, now we have a complete CD of music by one Australian sexual deviant, and tomorrow we'll have, <laughs> have another. <laughs> you know, because both Percy and, uh, well, you know, the, 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 I think one of the great tragedies of, of um, for, for Eugene Goosen's was, you know, the big scandal that happened here. And, Indeed, but he was he did immensely, a lot for Australian music. immensely important, mm. Mm. not least, badgering people into forming an opera company and building an opera house and, and and the the burghers of sydney said oh you know well fine well if you shut up we'll build you an opera house and we'll put it here and he said no 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 has to go on the promontory so not exactly. only did he was responsible for the place being built but he picked the site indeed he did and um, i'm very proud to have presented the bust of you so using oh, goosens which is there in the sydney opera house for yeah you. yeah, yeah no. so i uh, just to go back to your original history yeah. Yeah. back oh, to the original questions for andrew yes <laughs> I, I digress <laughs> program di yes exactly you've got your role in toronto at the moment devising programs so yes. you would have had quite a strong input into the early programs here with the melbourne symphony and ongoing of oh, course yes, yes i mean should we, we talk perhaps about the marla cycle you'd done a cycle previously i think once before with uh, toronto in toronto yes so so why another? I actually conducted the Canadian premiere of Mahler 8. Fantastic. Actually beat Charlie Dutois and the Montreal Symphony by about two months. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so and we have it. We have it, of course. We have a Mahler up. 8 in waiting for next year. Yes, we Absolutely. do. Absolutely, and it makes it even more tantalising that we've had this long wait. <laughs> yes. Well, the last time was. I, I guess time. for a conductor, though, embarking on this, you know, Mount Everest cycle, it, yeah. is, it, is it the the most challenging and terrifying? Yes, because uh, there's something about Mahler that's, um, you know, the range of the symphonies is extraordinary from, but even the first was so revolutionary. It's like, what do you mean you're writing a symphony and uh, all the themes are songs that you've written before? You can't do that, you know, it's, it's not allowed. So, he, you know, he broke the rules from the beginning and then every new symphony is, is sort of a complete rethinking of what a symphony is about. So actually the, contrast between them all is is enormous um, and, and people uh, here you know we're so accustomed to hearing Mahler symphonies these days and there seems to be such an appetite for Mahler currently doesn't there I think there is everywhere yeah um, um, but there was a period I mean you would have experienced it I would have thought as a boy in your 20s the great Mahler revival yeah. Um, post-war revival led by people like Bernstein, yeah, Bernstein in was America, but who yeah. for you was was the figurehead with Mahler in, in the UK and Europe when you were well, a lad? Uh, one of my heroes was Sir John Barbaroli. Actually, when I was, you know, Jeez, in my by teens. by the way. Yes, well, I... I've, I know I've, you've got a rehearsal after I've this. got a chorus rehearsal tonight, so I'm probably going to um, abstain <laughs> from this delicious But beverage, you have to have one little sip. Well, right, here we go. Otherwise, I can't drink alone. <laughs> <laughs> Here's to the next three weeks and beyond. <laughs> uh, what were you saying? <laughs> oh, it could be better now. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think, um, so f for me, it's, uh, I, you know, I've, I've, I've done various of the symphonies regularly over the years mm. as well, but um, some more than others, of course. The ninth has always been, for me, a very special piece. I remember doing it, um, on tour with the Toronto Symphony in Europe. And one of the nicest things that ever happened to me was that we did a concert in Stockholm and Elisabeth Söderström, who was this fantastic Swedish soprano that I worked with when I was very young and, and, and got to know very well, 
she came to the concert and she came backstage with tears streaming down her face. And you know, that's, that's the biggest, in a way, tribute you can get. That, mm. uh, this music is so extraordinary. And then the 10th, of course, is, is absolutely fascinating because uh, it's tantalizing because he never finished it. But on the other hand, you know, now we do have a complete, well, there are several different performing versions. So we could the Derry Cook version, which was, is most often mm. done. And, um, you mentioned Sir, Sir John Barbaroli there, though. Do people know this famous, legendary Italian stroke British conductor of the Halle Orchestra? Yes. When, how, how did you come across him and Mahler? Well, I mean, I, I heard him do Mahler too. And uh, he... There's a famous recording of his, isn't there, with the Berlin Philharmonic? Yes. The ninth, I think. The ninth is... Yeah. Uh, and there's a recording of the sixth, which is the slowest of the... He goes, rom. Boom, 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 have you boom, heard so Carry so On, though? <laughs> have you heard Carry On's recording of Mahler symphonies? Uh, I don't, well, some of them, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're more about Carry On than Mahler, I think. But my other hero was Barbara Ollie and also Otto Klemperer. I saw quite a lot of the end of his life. And you're talking about, I, my mind works very tangentially, so I apologize for this, but. Uh, <laughs> Klemperer, I remember, did an interview on, for the BBC, and it was very wide-ranging, and they asked him about, you know, composers and conductors, and they asked him about Carrion, and he was so rude about Carrion, it was quite funny, and then, and then he said, but he has a beautiful wife, I must say. <laughs> That'd go but, down well these days. <laughs> but it was interesting because, you know, I, I went to hear um, Klemperer conduct Beethoven, mm. And I went to hear Barb Raleigh to conduct Mahler, and of course Elgar and Delius and Vaughan Williams, and which he did so beautifully. And you were talking about, you know, m me doing English music. You say, actually, I, I have done some English music here, but um, we're doing Vaughan Williams' Fifth Symphony this week, and, and actually that will be the first time I've done a Vaughan Williams Symphony since I've been here. But the so Marla... Since I'm president of the Vaughan Williams <laughs> Society, it's rather, <laughs> it's about time. You're jumping ahead of me. Uh, the Mahler cycle, though, can I ask you a few more questions about that? Because yeah. I think it's, it's something that the audience here, um, you know, has really got their teeth into. There's such an expectation about you doing Mahler 8th with Margaret Court next year. Yes, well, you know, <laughs> it's a bit of an adventure because we don't really know how it's going to work acoustically. Well, it's always I... an adventure when you stage Mahler 8, I think, isn't it? Uh, it is a piece of theatre, really, isn't it? Oh, yes. Um, but um, did you fall in love with the Mahler symphonies when you first he heard them? Because, no. Yeah. Okay. It took me quite a long time to, yeah, I to can imagine to get to Mahler. Well, I think that's, you know, heartening for us all to hear that, to be honest. I, I was probably in my late 30s until it really... Mm. You know, I sort of began to see what it was all about. Because knowing other older German music, um, his forebears, doesn't really help you with Mahler, does it, in a way? No, no, not He's at such all. Such a unique and unorthodox German composer. Well, Austrian Austria. composer. <laughs> Austrian-Jewish composer. Yes, <laughs> and, yes, and mm. also the fact that, um, you know, at, in his time, he was actually much more famous as a conductor than he was as a composer. Well, that's an interesting point too, isn't it? Because he was often criticized, I think, wasn't it? For, yes. for, for being a magpie as a composer and basically grabbing bits and pieces of all the composers he conducted to throw into his symphonies like a minestrone or something. That, yes, that's <laughs> right. And, and then, you know, folk elements and popular yeah, music. There's everything in there, Jewish, you know, klezmer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, but they were the sounds which at the he time heard, was, weren't was, they? Yeah, well, it was sort yeah. of revolutionary. It's yeah. like, you know, it's like writing a symphony with, with the tunes of the, based on your songs, you know, and, and it's like he, uh, as I say, the, and the second symphony, okay, you know, we've had, we had our Beethoven 9 with Coral of I, but, but, you know, the, the, the last Races. one with the Mahler 2 is, is an extraordinary vision. Mm. And then 3, of course, is something completely different. So what actually finally sold you on Mahler, just working on the symphonies? Just, uh, you know, I, I remember I, the first one I conducted was one, <laughs> which I did in Milan in the days when, when the Italians had a lot of radio orchestras. No, they only have, have one left in... Um, right. In, uh, right. In, um, oh, Turin, is In Turin, it? yes, Turin, Torino. Yeah. But, um, and, and I remember that was a kind of... It was a sort of revelation. I mean, I'd spent a lot of time mm. preparing it. Mm. And that was like, all of a sudden, it was like, oh, 
yes, can I do some more, please, you know. <laughs> so conducting a cycle, I want to ask you, what does it do for an orchestra playing the whole cycle? I'm, admittedly, obviously, it's over quite a long period of time. But um, having seen the, the orchestra twice now do this evolution, because I saw it with Marcus Stenz the right. first time, um, and now with you, um, obviously, the orchestra evolves doing it, but you as the conductor too, is there an evolution for you as you get more and more into his language? Well, you know, one hopes as one gets older, one, one has more, more, more um, insight or, yeah. you know, yeah. it ain't necessarily so, but I, <laughs> I mean, I do, yes, I do think that, you know, the more you do something. And is he a good composer for orchestras to play? I would say so, wouldn't you? Yes. <laughs> yes. Why, I mean, why do you say that? Because he's very complicated. It is very complicated and it's challenging. Yeah. But it's also incredibly rewarding when it comes off. It works. You know, and you have a great sense of a, of accomplishment. Um, and I, um, uh, I've I've done. I did the second symphony, uh, the seventh symphony, um, this uh, last year. Um, with, in Toronto, well, actually it was this year, it was from April this year, and we, um, we took it to Montreal Auto as well then, and that, that was the one, <coughs> one of the ones that, you know, I found less approachable, least approachable, and it always has sort of been the ugly duckling in a way. But I, I find it fascinating, um, but you always, with Marlon, you have to take it, you can't sort of make apologies for it and say, so, for instance, the finale of Marla 7 is actually the most schizophrenic piece of music I know, when you have various thematic ideas, and they, they appear in different tempi all the time, mm. you know? Mm. And it's like, when you're playing it, and you know, you've been rehearsing it, and you get to a passage, and it's like, oh, is this, is this where it comes fast or slow, you know? <laughs> but, but, but if you accept that and, and, and make the most of this craziness about it, then it comes off tremendously. Um, so Does he I, leave detailed instructions on the scores? Is he? Yes. Is oh yes. He, you know, he he was. He, that's another way in which Mahler made history because you know he he the, the detail with which he marked every single part of uh, of the orchestra it was unprecedented. You know, I mean. So some conductors don't follow that instruction. Well, Oh, well, yes, I mean. There's uh, so much variety in Mahler interpretation. Well, I mean, the point is that, for instance. You know, with Brahms or, or Vorjak. Vorjak is a case in point because Vorjak, you always have to be a bit careful, careful balancing because he'll write, you know, if there's that passage, you'll write fortissimo in the whole orchestra. And you have to say, <laughs> what's that? Actually, <laughs> the first time I ever conducted the Chicago Symphony was in 1974, so I was 30. And, uh, and we were doing Vorjak 7 in the D minor. And the first rehearsal, I, I uh, and it was the first time I'd been to the States, and we played the exposition of the first moment, and I stopped and I said, and I, why this came out of my mouth, and as I was saying it, I was thinking, what are you doing? Because I, I said, um, the brass section of this orchestra is justly world famous, but I'd, I'd actually like to hear everybody else. <laughs> And I thought, oh, that's it. That's it. And, you know, the string players and the woodwind players all shuffled their feet. And I look up at the brass, and finally they started to grin, which was, I th I'm sure, it was, if I'd been an American, they wouldn't have let me do it, because the British accent you know, <laughs> helps you get away with all sorts of things sometimes. <laughs> but, um, no, but, but Mahler, you know, he, he will, he, he, because he was so experienced as a conductor, mm. He, he would, uh, you know, he would mark something in the woodwind fortissimo, but then, uh, you know, the brass would be mezzo forte. Uh, and there are passages, for instance, when you have one bar where the strings play, uh, the strings and the woodwind are basically doubling each other, but the one bar, the, the, the woodwind play forte and the strings play piano, and then he swaps it around, which is, you know, it gives a sort of unique kind of color, change of color. Mm. And that's the sort of thing that, that nobody had really done before. Mm. It was the sort of general dynamics. And, and then you often find a passage that's quite gentle, you know, mezzo piano or something, strings, and the harp will be marked forte because he knew that sometimes the harp won't come through the texture. So there are lots of examples of that that, uh, uh, and then, you know, other composers followed suit. 
And, you know, more and more composers in the, in the 20th century were much more specific about dynamics and articulation and so on. I think that's Stravinsky the other thing, if I could um, jump around a bit too, that um, people might have been surprised about your repertoire here, Sir Andrew, is your embracing of contemporary music um, with 100% support of the, the composers involved. Yeah, well, I mean, I did have 11 years as chief conductor of, of the BBC Symphony. True, where well, you must have done a lot, does of a, a lot of new music. New music, some of which was wonderful and some of which was <laughs> but not so wonderful. That was my other comment, I suppose, <laughs> that it doesn't matter whether it is a total success or not. You have embraced the new as yes, well, and with I enthusiasm. Think, yeah. Yeah, yes, and I, I think, you know, if composers are writing for orchestra and they don't get to hear the, you know, the, the, it's because it's a learning experience mm. composing for orchestra, obviously. Mm. What other highlights would you list from your time here as chief conductor? I mean, there's been, when I look back over the years, I mean, it, as you said, it's not as long a tenure as some of your others, but the amount of music that you have given us and the breadth, as you said, also is quite extraordinary. I would, I would personally put up the top there as your, your Strauss legacy from the, rec the recordings of oh, Strauss. Yeah. Well, and we, yes, and they've, of course, ABC has recorded a lot. Yes, exactly, for ABC Classic. Um, but what would you put up there, do you think? Well, Strauss is one yeah. of my favorites. Yeah, you adore I, Strauss. I adore Strauss. I love the operas. I've done a lot of the operas. Um, and, the, and they are, well, they, again, he's very specific about, you know, dynamics and, and, and the, the... This orchestra plays Strauss really well, doesn't it? They do, <laughs> yes. Fits like a glove. Yes, and... Uh, and the opera's in concert, um, you know, with your opera hat on, ex Glyndebourne, now yes, at yeah. Lyric Chicago. If you ever get a chance to go and see Sir Andrew's company, they, you better be quick, but it's a fantastic <laughs> experience. Well, you know what we're doing oh. in April this year, don't you? <laughs> The ring. Oh, you're doing the ring, that's right. <laughs> so get your, get your skates on. Yeah. It's the most beautiful <laughs> theatre, isn't it? it well, yeah. it, it's one of the great art deco yeah. treasures of, of the States. Yeah. I mean, it was of built world, in 19, 1928, yeah. it's absolutely gorgeous. But yeah, bringing that experience here with the operas in concerts, because some people would nod their head and think, well, you know, we've got an opera company, why do we need a symphony orchestra playing opera? Well, that's but why I like, yes, I like to do, well, well we did Thais, mm. Massenet. And you're doing one. Hansel and Gretel shortly. And we're doing Hansel and Gretel. <laughs> and they're both operas I adore. Um, and in fact, but it works very well in a concert yes. presentation, doesn't it? It does, yeah. You know? And it's great for the players, the musicians, to work with singers. Yeah, well, uh, again, I just did uh, Thais in, in Toronto mm. week before last, and the orchestra loved it because they don't get to play operas very often That's either. That's right, yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, what's the feedback you get from the musicians about playing opera? Well, they were all kind of, and we had a very good cast. It was Aaron Wall, uh, but ve very good singers. And here in Melbourne? Yes, we, like. yeah, well, I think everyone had a good time playing it here. And, and um, it's, uh, because it's a different experience. And, you know. There's no director to get well, away. Yes, that's. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, did I say that? No director to interfere <laughs> with the music. <laughs> Actually, I've been very lucky in my life. I've, I've all, all worked really pretty exclusively with, with directors that yeah. I like. Well, I've had a certain amount of control over that, so that doesn't hurt. And because, uh, you know, there, I would, I would be miserable, I think, doing a, a production of something that I really thought was totally against the music, and yeah. heaven knows there there are quite of those, a lot of those around, especially <laughs> in certain parts of Europe. Who's directing your ring cycle? Um, David Pountney. That's right. Who was more or less contemporary of mine. He's a little younger than me, but uh, we've known each other for years. We haven't worked together an enormous amount, but I've always admired his work, and he'd never done a ring before. And so when we asked him to do a new production, he was very excited. And uh, he, it, his, it's marvelous actually what he's done so far and we've so we've done the first three and we go to Demering is coming up um just after christmas and then we the whole thing we run so you could do that here as laureate couldn't you at some point what the ring the ring in concert yes why not <laughs> no, what a good idea <laughs> it, it is of course huge i mean it's, yeah. it's the biggest thing 
any composer ever conceived of. <laughs> and and I've, I, it was astonishes me that, you know, he started with the libretti and he went backwards. So he started with Goethe Deron, which was originally called Siegfried's Tort, Siegfried's Death. And then he thought, well, okay, now we need to explain what happened before that. So then he wrote the Rhetor of Siegfried. And, then, <laughs> and so he kept going backwards and he got to the gold being at the bottom of the Rhine at the beginning of the whole thing. Um, and then he started to write the operas in, in the, their order. He got two thirds of the way through Siegfried, the third opera, and stopped. And it's like, okay. Uh, and he's like, Oh, I'll finish this later. <laughs> it's like, okay, and how long? And he, it was almost 10 years before he went back to it because then he wrote Tristan Isolde and Meistersinger. And actually, Goethe Demeron would not be what it is probably if he hadn't had the experience of writing those two other great operas because in some ways it's so much more complex and, and, and skillful and sophisticated. Mm. Um, when, when did singers come into your life? Because you were initially a, a keyboard nerd, as you described yourself once. I think <laughs> you were very... The piano was your first love, then the organ, or you were a chorister too, Well, not you? Look so, yeah. But when did, you know, opera come into your life? Okay, again, very late. Late. I wasn't... What, I what mean, was your first opera you saw, do you remember? Well, I have to tell you this because... Um, uh, when Anthony Freud, who is now the director of the Lyric Opera of Chicago, who is also a Brit, uh, came to us about eight years ago, I suppose, we had a joint press conference and, and they were asking him questions. And they said, what was your first experience of opera? And he said, well, I was six years old and I went to see Elisia d'Amore uh, at the old Sadler's Wells Theatre in London. And I said, well, isn't that extraordinary? It was the old Sadler's Wells Theatre in London where I saw my first opera. And he said, and what was it? And I said, it was a double bill of Stravinsky, <laughs> Le Rossignol, and Schoenberg, Erwartung. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, everybody <laughs> lost it because it's like, be, because, I, mean, I came to that because I, you know, I was probably about 15 or 16, and I'd just become fascinated with 20th century music. Um, I had a wonderful person that, at the Royal Academy of Music where I used to go on Saturday mornings all through my teens who, who introduced me first of all to Stravinsky and it was like, and um, so uh, I thought, well, I'll, I'll go and see an opera and you know, Stravinsky <laughs> showed me, why not? <laughs> so I, I you know, approached opera and then the next thing I saw was probably- So you approached opera from the really squeaky gaked end and went back to the bel yes. canto repertoire and 19th century Thais and Hansel and Gretel and- Yes, and, and until I went to Chicago in 2000, I hadn't conducted a complete Wagner opera. Uh-huh. Or indeed a Puccini opera. So that was, yeah. uh, that was fun to, to actually- So it's been a late love. Yes, well, re yes, relatively speaking. Because and of course, you know, I, I you. first went to Glyndebourne in 1973. Um, and then, you know, I used to go fairly regularly and then I was, of course, music director for 12 years. And, uh, but still, we didn't, we didn't, you know, we didn't, I think, I think they did Bohème. It was the mm. only Puccini opera we did and there was no Wagner. We've subsequently done both Tristan and Meistersinger since my time, but... Um, you must have had a, um, a knack working with singers did you did you find that from well being an accompanist being a keyboard repetitor as it were yes an organist did that sort of come naturally because people like Rene Fleming certainly say you're a singer's conductor well I, I yes I like singers mm. I, I like I like voices <laughs> and and I did a lot of accompanying when I you know in my early days before mm. I became sort of more or less exclusive conductor and I um, so you know, I used to do song titles and things with people. Um, so, because you really have worn these two hats as an, a you know, very successful opera conductor and the, the symphony orchestra well, and I think for they, a long time now. I, yeah. I think they, they complementary. I think they are complementary. Mm. I mean, I think conducting opera gives you a, a sense of drama and timing mm. that is also important in symphonic music as well. Um, so, yes, I. I um, and people say, which do you prefer? And, I, and it's a stupid question. <laughs> so, you know, I, 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 I love them equally, really. Yeah. And, and I, although I'm going to be doing, once I leave uh, the Lyric Opera in Chicago, I'm 
going to be doing very little opera because it takes up too much time. And I want to slow down. You know, I want to work half the year. We heard it here first, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Andrew is slowing down. Well, that brings me really to what's happening over the next three weeks. And it is your wonderful mashup of, of interests, in a sense, isn't it? All coming together. I have to find the quote that you, you gave us, I think, somewhere about um, this piece that opens the concert this week. Right. Um, what did you describe it as? Um, well, my son's new. An piece. unadulterated, shameless piece of nepotism. <laughs> A new piece opens this concert by Edward Frazier Davis. Who could this be? Yeah, oh, God. <laughs> He wrote a piece for... Um, this is Sir Andrew's son. Have you heard yes. about this? The opening work of the concert this week? Yes, and, uh, and he's written a piece for the chorus and the orchestra, which um, you know, he wanted to write a sort of celebratory piece, and, and he was looking for, actually, he looking for uh, maybe an Australian text to say it, but in fact, you know, he couldn't find the, exactly the right thing. So he said a text by Hildegard, Hildegard von Bingham, which mm. is about, you know... The, the, it's it's called um, <clears throat> um, it's about the the spirit and 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 uh, um, what the spirit of life gives us and so it's it's a beautiful text and and actually in uh, about uh, thirty eight minutes I have a rehearsal in this very room with the chorus. <laughs> Fantastic. Has he written anything else for you before? He, he wrote a piece for the Toronto Children's Chorus and the Toronto Symphony, that's... Um, is he any good? Well, and he, his forte is choral music and Fantastic. he's... Fantastic. I wonder where he gets that from. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, and so he... He must be very proud of it. The summer of last year, he walked the Camino de Santiago, you know, which is the pilgrimage. Yeah. Uh, yep, across the top Spain. of Spain. He came, back, he came back and wrote an absolutely fantastic piece that was kind of inspired by that experience of mm -hmm. a cappella. Cool. We look forward to hearing that. And then you did touch briefly there on Vaughan Williams, whom we haven't heard a lot of during your time here, actually. We I would love to no. hear more Vaughan Williams. We've had some <coughs> pieces, but you're doing the fifth, which is a fantastic piece. Well, the fifth is interesting because the fourth, uh, which was written between the two war world wars, mm. is a very gritty piece indeed. Yeah. And he said about it, I know it's ugly, but I meant it. <laughs> and then the Fifth Symphony, which was written during the Second World War, is one of the most serene pieces of music mm. I know. It's glorious. It's fantastic. It's one with a passacaglia at the end, isn't it? The yes. <coughs> and, uh, Transcendental the, ending. The, well, the, the, the ending of the last one mm. is, is heaven. I mean, you know, it, heaven's open. And uh, I've, I've, I've done it a fair amount, um, and I absolutely adore you it. You recorded it, I think, too, didn't you? I'm yes, I recorded... Back with the BBC. I've, I've recorded them, them all. Mm. Um, and, uh, yes, it is a piece I love, uh, especially of, of Vaughan Williams. Yeah. And we also have Beethoven's first, first piano concerto with Piers Lane, which I'm really looking forward to very Should be much. a lot of fun together. Yes, I like Piers a <laughs> lot. And then we have... Um, Hansel and Gretel. Uh, pardon? Hansel and Gretel, yes. Oh, Hansel and Gretel. I thought you said some other jokey title you drink <laughs> up, like Massonet's Thighs. Massonet's Thighs, yes. Um, Massonet's Thighs. Now, Hansel and Gretel, you said that that's one of your top five operas. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What, why is that? I think it's one of the most sort of life-affirming pieces I know. I mean, it has a, it, it has a, uh, almost a naivete about it, mm. but... Um, you know, it's messages of hope, and, and there's a lot of humor in it as well, of course. Um, and I I remember the first time I did it, it was at the Met in New York, at Metropolitan Opera, and, and we were rehearsing, and I had a conversation with the first horn player, and um, uh, I said, you know, I've always thought it's Wagner's best opera because you don't have to wade through all the boring bits. <laughs> Did you say something else about it being <laughs> Wagner on Prozac or something? Well, yeah, and he, he said, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, no, thanks, <laughs> don't mind jokes for me. And he said, Whoops. yes, <laughs> yes, it's like, I've always thought it's like Wagner on Prozac. You know? <laughs> but the best comment came from Damien in the, in the Melbourne Symphony, because I was talking about Damien it last year. And um, we, I, I relayed this conversation I'd had in New York, and he said, he said, yes, it's like Wagner, but written by a nice person. <laughs> <laughs> Gilbert Wumpertink. Yeah, and that, but it is a beautiful piece. It is piece. a glorious piece, isn't it? And it's beautiful to play for the orchestra, too, I have to say. Yeah. Oh, good. 
Yeah, no, it'll be wonderful to hear it. It's, it's, it's a very Christmassy sort of piece, isn't it? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, a children's story, I suppose. Um, and then we have uh, Sir Andrew's Messiah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know why I'm laughing at <laughs> about this, but I think you had a poster, didn't you? Mega Messiah yes, with when, Marimba. Uh, yeah, that's right. Toronto. That was in Toronto. Had it, <coughs> when I first did it in uh, 2010. Yes, Toronto's Mega Messiah now with Marimba. Um, uh, but it was interesting because uh, actually the moment when I decide to do it is sort of lost. I can't remember exactly what it is that... Well, um, I mean, something that's been cooking for a long time because you would have played continuo in it, wouldn't oh, you? Oh, yes. I Way mean, back uh, in your... I mean, I sang it when I was a kid. I played continuo in quite yeah, a few So you've done a few messiahs. Well, not a lot, actually. All right. I've conducted a great deal, but... Um, I, I've also done some Bach transcriptions for orchestra. I did the big C minor Passacaglia and Fugue and a couple of chorale preludes, not a lot, but... Um, and uh, so when they asked me to, to, do, to do it in Toronto in 2010, I, because of course, I mean, there's the Mozart version, which is fascinating um, and successful at times and not successful at other times, mm. in my opinion. I mean, it's a remarkable. To study of, of one has composer. has done a number of different versions yes. over the years, too. And then, it? of course, there was the so called Beecham version, <laughs> which wasn't made by Beecham, it was made by Goosens. Right. But that's very sort of grand and mm. rather over Overblown. orchestrated, I think. It's a bit too plush. So, what did you want to do with your orchestration, which I should tell the audience has been done by the Toronto um, Symphony Orchestra and has been recorded and yes. Grammy nominated, I think? And yes, it was. Mm. Um, but now it's coming to, to Melbourne. Now it's coming to Melbourne. Well, I, I, you know, what I wanted <coughs> to do was actually utilise all the colours of the, you know, the modern symphony orchestra to, to, uh, because I... What Handel know, I, would have done if he'd had his... Well, maybe. You maybe. Know, that's right. Well, if you... <laughs> so, it, you know, it, it has triple wind, including alto flute and oboe d'amore and bass clarinet and contrabassoon and... Uh, there's some. <laughs> yeah, I remember. <laughs> and there is some percussion, although each time I've done it, I've taken more of the percussion out. I do you hear a whisper that you had a sheep bleating at some point. Yes, there is a... I haven't decided... That in All We Like Sheep, there is a bleat <laughs> at one point, and I haven't decided whether I'm going to do it or not. <laughs> because I got cold feet when we recorded it, and I left it out. <laughs> um, Very sheepish of you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but, but... So, you know, and there are moments... For instance, um, well, it, it, it's, you know, it, it, and the big moments are big. Um, but will audiences recognize it? I hope so. Yes, of course. But for instance, I know that by Redeemer Liveth, the soprano uh, mm. aria at the beginning of the third part, um, starts with solo clarinet and string quartet, mm. so, um, so, which is quite, quite radical. Um, but... Um, but it's actually a very serious venture for you, I think, isn't it? Because you've dedicated it to your parents. Yes. My, why, my why was that? Well, my father just died that year. My mother died considerably earlier in, the, in 1996. But um, they, were, they were very uh, religious, both of them. And uh, so this was something that I thought they would... It was a suitable thing to, to compose, and, uh, compose, to orchestrate in in their memory and um, yeah there there are some moments in it uh, there's one or two kind of well, there's a chorus the lord gave the word great was the company of the preachers which sometimes gets cut and of course there are cuts in my version we don't do the whole thing but you know i was looking at the text and thinking great was the company of the preachers and i thought of the salvation army so there are two tambourines in that. Oh, no. <laughs> you are wicked. <laughs> yes, I, well, there are a few, few wicked things. But Handel, I, I mean, All We Like Sheep, for instance, is quite witty. Yes, it's very actually. witty. Yeah, and, and Handel so was tried, witty, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful sequence of surely he hath borne our griefs and then, um, and with his stripes we are healed and then All We Like Sheep, which basically I do all three of them in the same tempo. And it's an extraordinary sequence of... Uh, well, it's, it's, a, it's an it's important it's annual event here in Melbourne, so we're really looking forward to it with bells on because it's obviously yeah, going yeah. to be something very, very special. <laughs> yeah, and the Hallelujah, of course. Actually, there are two 
only two cymbal crashes in the whole thing. One is on the very last chord of the Amen chorus, right at the end. The other one is in the Hallelujah chorus. And I, me I remember I was uh, doing this orchestration. I, I was in um, uh, Santa Fe at the opera there, the summer opera. And so I did a lot of it there. And, and I remember d working on the Hallelujah chorus. And so, so, we, so the other cymbal crash is, the kingdom of this world is the crescendo the <laughs> on the upbeat. And I, I did that one day and I couldn't stop laughing all day. <laughs> you said finally that your, your parents were very religious. Did that rub off on you or how would well, you describe I, your own religiosity, I, Sir Andrew? Well, they, they were sort of evangelical yeah, Church okay. of England. And, and you uh, went through the Anglican tradition. And yeah, I, I, I'm not a religious person. I, in fact, I'm... Well, I have a healthy skepticism about religion in general, but um, uh, but I'm very spiritual, if that makes any sense. I mean, I think I totally believe in in in, in a, a dimension which is beyond us and encompasses us all, and, and 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 hopefully binds us all together. You know, we live in a world that's very fractious right now, particularly living in the states. I have to say, is difficult mm -hmm. at the moment. But you know, music and art, the arts in general, are something that we have to cherish because it, it does bring beauty into the world and, and emotion and spirituality and, 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 and it brings us all together. Brings us all together. Yeah. Sir Andrew, I'm sure some people here are burning to ask you a question or two. Um, we've got a few minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Can, can I just raise your hand if you're keen to ask Sir Andrew a question? Without notice? Come on, come on. Yes, sir. Just over here. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Sir Andrew. Um, one of the composers that hasn't been mentioned tonight is Berlioz. And <laughs> I as a member of singing with the MSO Chorus and listening to some of your Berlioz. I particularly enjoyed it, I must say. And I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit about your affinity with Berlioz. Well, you, well, you <laughs> asked me about you know highlights here. Berlioz is certainly you know we've done the Symphony Fantastique and and we did Harold in Italy and, and we did Damnation Romeo and Juliet. Um, mm? Damnation of Faust. Damnation of Faust. Fabulous. And I do adore Berlioz. Was one of the composers I took to immediately, again because mm. totally original, and you know. People always talk about the Rite of Spring as being one of the pivotal pieces in the in the history of music, and it certainly is because it, you know it brought a conception of what music could be and what music could do, particularly in terms of rhythm, that was you know revolutionary. But I think the piece that uh, the other piece that really comes in the same category is the Berlioz Symphony Fantastique, which was written three years after Beethoven died. <laughs> and, and, you know, again, it's, it's a bit like Mahler. You say, what do you mean you're writing a symphony about some guy who's under the influence of laudanum or whatever, and having dreams about his girlfriend, you know? <laughs> um, so it, it, Berlioz is a great original and, yeah. uh, again, fantastic to play. Um, uh, so, yeah. I've got a question here from Samantha on our live stream here, Sir Andrew, and she says, is there still something you haven't conducted that you would love to? And is there anything you would never like to perform again? Well, there are two pieces I have sworn that I would never conduct, and I've managed to keep to that. Um, one is the 1812 Overture, <laughs> and the other is Carmen Burana, which I know is a remarkable, but I, you know, let's let somebody else conduct it. And the other, th the other thing I really don't like is the tone poems of Liszt. <laughs> I think are pretty <laughs> awful. But no, I, I mean, and it was, because I've been thinking about this, you know, because people have asked me this before, there must be something that you haven't conducted that you would like to. And there are a few pieces, I, I, you know, at one point I thought I'd like to conduct Schoenberg's opera Moses and Aaron. But it is so difficult. It's very, very difficult. And it's so difficult to listen to. And you know, these days opera companies don't want to put it on, so I've sort huge. of given it's up on it. It's huge, it's an expensive cast too, isn't it? Yes. It's a big orchestra. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, and, and a very difficult chorus part. Mm -hmm. So, you know, although that was, you know, <laughs> on my list is, and so there really isn't much that I can think of that, that I haven't done that I, you know, think, oh, I have to do that. Now there are some pieces that I haven't done very often that, that I- Revisit. Yeah. Mm. Any other questions?
to return briefly, you mentioned it's a bit difficult living in the United States. I'm sure you're not alone in that. A yeah. tradition of presidents, not necessarily hoping for a change of president, but a tradition of presidents is that they write a letter to the next president that they leave in the desk when they leave office. Is there something that you would like to leave as a message to your um, future? Uh, My successor future? here, you mean, whoever that may be. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, it's interesting. I mean, I, I am leaving Chicago, the Lyric, at the end of next season, so uh, April 21. And um, I was very much involved in the, in the choice of my successor, and so I'm delighted with, with that. And I, I was also instrumental in choosing the next conductor of the Toronto Symphony. I mean, you know, I, I gave my input. So, um, and I don't know what's happening here. Um, but, you know, uh, it's, there really isn't a lot you can say because each individual person has to find their own relationship with mm. the orchestra and the organization and so on. So, you know, I've, I've, uh, the Gustavo Jimeno is taking over in Toronto next season. He, uh, he and I talked and uh, emailed a bit. And he said, is there anything you can, you know, warn me about or tell me about? <laughs> and I said, not really. I mean, you know, I mean, he's come, he comes from Europe uh, and he conducts the orchestra in Luxembourg where they have more money than we ever dream of, really. So he's used to being able to do all sorts of programs that doesn't matter if you sell tickets or not. And <laughs> so, you know, coming to North America, and it's the same here. I mean, mm. programming is, and, you know, we music directors or chief conductors or constantly having battles with marketing departments, but uh, I didn't say that, no. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, no, like I, a kid I, at a toy pro shop. Programming is know. something I love to do, mm. and it's fascinating, but, but yeah, know. they have to balance the books. Yes, they have to balance the books, okay. and uh, so, you know, it, it's I suppose a it's like any job, isn't it? You know, you cannot prepare anybody for that job. They have to find out for no, themselves. No, they have to find out way. for themselves. And that's part so, of the adventure. Uh, so, yes, I mean, I, yeah. I think, you know, be yourself and make music the way you make music, but, you know, be open to what the orchestra, well, I mean, it's, it's, I, people who are gonna come here to be the chief conductor don't need me to tell them how, how to react with an orchestra because, but, but you know, to, to take what the orchestra gives you, I think is very important to listen and, and kind of feel the collective personality if there, you know, there, are, there is such a thing, I think, in orchestras. <laughs> Uh, and 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 then kind of you know marry yourself to that so to speak. I think it, that's um, and there you know there are very fine orchestras and fine conductors who don't get on for whatever reason mm -hmm. you know and and it's uh, it could be just temperament or you know. Um, you worked out what that chemistry is. It's like a it is like a human thing, isn't it? Relationships. Some work, yes. some don't. Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, and, and mostly I've, I've, you know, enjoyed working with orchestras. At the beginning of my career, I never, I didn't feel particularly comfortable in Germany because I always felt that German orchestras, and I think it's much different now, mm. but there was this thing of, you know, they expected the conductor to be the boss and to, you know, the whip, them, whip them, and I'm, I'm not a whipper, really. Exactly. I, a whipper snapper. When did you uh, find out uh, that humour is a very powerful tool as a conductor? Because you have this irrepressible sense of humour. Were you like that as a kid? Um, were you the joker in the class, or were you? <laughs> <laughs> because you know, humour is a great tool, isn't it, to diffuse, you know, tension and, and situations yes. and uh, yes, artistic I temperament. Um, you know, and you use it very effectively. You're very self-deprecating, which is unusual for a maestro too. You think? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> well, you know, I, I Some suppose take themselves very seriously. I've, I've always thought, or probably said, that I take music very seriously and my job very seriously, but I try not to, make, to take myself too seriously, <laughs> because I think, um, you know, there's in the, in the, as one stands before this fantastic legacy of, of great music that we live with. You know, one one ought to feel humble, ever so humble, as Dickens put it. Uh, and so, we, so th for me, I, I've always tried to keep that perspective that, 
you know, of course, I have to have strong views. I have to have a really clear view of what I want to do with any given piece of music. But um, the fact that, you know, we, we are so privileged to do this is, uh, is the sort of root of my feeling about making music and life in general. So, and yes, I, I think that humor is, is an important part of life. And, and, and you know, it's, and there's, there's, you know, there's humor in music too that I think, well, I was talking about Handel and all we like sheep, you know, all we like sheep and then have gone astray. How's you? I've gone astray. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's like there's a bit in the Strauss Alpine <laughs> Symphony where, where he was wandering off the path. And I don't know whether he, he, he actually it got inspiration from Handel, but it, it does a very similar thing where it sort of, you know, you get lost and it dis at the end of the phrase disappears. <laughs> Sir Andrew's Guide to Humor and Music. Any more questions, anybody? Good, yes, sir. You made a passing reference um, to the Mozart Messiahs, but could I ask you more broadly, um, do you have an affinity with um, Mozart's choral works and his concertos, particularly his piano concertos? The, the Mozart piano concertos are a sort of miracle unto themselves. Uh, they, they are, I sometimes think they're, well, apart from you know the, the great operas, they're his greatest work, and they're the most imaginative. And of course, partly because he played a lot of them himself, and that's why we, you know we don't have cadenzas for quite a lot of them. Which is and the one, cause the ones that we do have are so fantastic that no, I, I adore Mozart, and and, of, and actually you know we talk about my five favorite operas, and and Hans and Gretel, one of, the, of course, the Marriage of Figaro is another. I think it's one of the most oh, incredible yes. things. Perfection. And <laughs> and you look at the woodwind writing in the Marriage of Figaro, and you look at the woodwind woodwind writing in the piano concertos. There's a lot of uh, similarities. You know, that so the, so that the woodwind especially have this this sort of solo <coughs> dialogue with with the piano, the way they do, for instance, uh, the wonderful Susanna Zari de Vieni, which is, has flute, oboe, and bassoon. Yeah. Uh, sort of obligato is uh, and the man was mm. is breathtaking uh, you know it's the, yeah, the, the 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 inspiration the the spontaneity of mm. what comes across in Mozart is quite unlike anything else got a couple more questions here from our um our feed and uh, there's one here from Lucy who says alongside your immense musical style your musical style, Sir Andrew, we're all grown to adore you for your dress style. Are you aware that you're a fashionista here? I'm wondering if you have a favorite colored turtleneck skivvy. <laughs> <laughs> here we go, red. <laughs> no, I, I suppose turtlenecks is, I, is <laughs> turtlenecks are kind of my uniform because I, I find them very comfortable to rehearse <laughs> in and well, to live in actually. But so, I, no, I don't, I've never thought of myself as a fashioned plate by any means, quite the reverse, I think I'm, <laughs> I'm not a snappy dresser. I just like, to, I like to be a comfortable dresser at Fair all enough. times. Do you have any special memory, favorite memories with MSO musicians over these years, Sir Andrew? Well, You've done these tours where, you know, the gloves come off in a way, you know, um, it's like the school camp, isn't it? You really get to know each other. <laughs> <laughs> so you yes, must have some I, great memories. I yes, I mean, and I remember the, the concerts we did in 2014, especially in the prom, we played Symphony Fantastique and the Edinburgh Festival where, where we played- um, Granger. Granger, yes, <laughs> The Warriors. And the, which is the most incredible piece, I have Glad to say. Glad you, you took that to the world. Yes, and uh, we only played it that, on that one occasion. How I'd many pianos are in that? Three. Three, yeah. <laughs> three. <laughs> only three. Only three. And, and one Warriors. of my old friends in England came and played with us, and he was, uh, who is, he is a complete Granger nut, so he was totally in heaven. <laughs> Because performances of the Warriors are few and far between. Yeah, I mean, yes, so I have. Memories with this band, this bunch of wonderful people? Well, they're, they're, they are a bunch of wonderful people. And, I think you know, a so. lot, lot of characters and, 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 you know, various temperaments that all somehow managed to 
melds together into something that's uh, fantastic. I think there is a special corps de, de esprit de corps with this orchestra, though, because there's often a lot of rumblings in orchestras. It's like any bunch of people, isn't it? But well, there's, course, yeah. there is a great collective will in this orchestra. I've worked with a number of orchestras as a broadcaster around the world, and uh, it seems to me the MSO is one of the happiest ones. Yes, I think so. There's a great spirit mm. and, and, a, and a, of mutual respect for each other. And I mutual think respect. Yeah. I think that's tremendously important, you know, to, but come to on, value your... come on, a favourite juicy memory. Favourite... Favourite what? Favourite juicy memory of your juicy. time. Juicy. Juicy. Well, I prefer not to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's an overrated <laughs> quality. No, I mean, one of the... Th I have to tell you frankly, because, you know, this, I, this is the end of my time as chief conductor here, and I leave Chicago in 18 months, and, I, you know, I've been doing this temporary thing... Well, you be writing thing. your memoirs? Well, people... No, I'm not... Gonna I might write a novel, but um, and I do have some stories, of course. But I'm I'm actually really looking forward to losing all my administrative responsibilities and just just have fun making music. You know, that's going to be great. Huh. No more. Well, you know, you've got to get out of here because I'm rehearsing with the chorus in <laughs> ten minutes. So we can all sing along. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One last question from this lady here at the back. This isn't really a question, but I think I speak for a great many people when I just wanted to say thank you to Sir Andrew for the joy that you have brought to us through your leadership and your conducting of the orchestra. I've been a subscriber for over 30 years and it's just been wonderful. Thank you. Thank, well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Sir Andrew. That's the kind of question I like. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure being here with all of you, and, and, and so come and hear us in these next yeah, three indeed. weeks. Indeed. Thank yeah. you for the music, and may there be more of it for many years to come. Thank you. <laughs> right. Shall we? <laughs>